Well, good morning and welcome to this online service here from Blackpool Tabernacle Church. We'll continue to share our services online, even those that happen in person in the church. This is our morning service, and so the service will include the worship songs that we have sung in church this morning, the children's talk and song, as well as a reading and prayer and the sermon from Pastor Vincent Tracy uh, that we have had in this morning's service. We will put at the end of this service our contact details. If you do want to reach out to us or find anything else out about the church, uh, or just get in touch if there's any way. Well, good morning, mums and dads, boys and girls, and welcome to another one of our talks on love. Now, the verse of today says, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. Right. I wonder what you think about when you hear the word delight. I know what I think about. I think about chocolate. I think about angel delight, I think about Turkish delight, 
Now I'm sure you've had at least one of those and I'm sure that you've had a very very enjoyable experience when it's gone into your mouth. Very delicious isn't it? Now if we delight in something it means we really 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 enjoy it okay. Now there's lots of other things which we can enjoy isn't there? God has given us a great world which although there's lots of wrong things in it there's lots of enjoyable things as well. You know, I've recently, I didn't always like plants all that much, but uh, recently I really delighted in growing orchids. And I just go and I look at that orchid and I see that plant, I go, wow, isn't that amazing? All those different colours, all those different shapes and the symmetry and it, I just feel, it just fills me with delight. Yeah, it's just like, a, it's like a, it gives me a lot of pleasure. I really enjoy it and I like seeing it in my room. You know, uh, lots of other things give us delight as well. But sometimes wrong things give us delight, things which are not right, things which are sinful or wrong. And those are the things which God doesn't want us to delight in at all. In fact, if we do delight in them, God says that the lo his love is not there within us. Now, there's another thing which the verse says, doesn't it? The verse also says, love rejoices in the truth. I wonder what what is the truth? What is the truth? Well, Jesus says himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. Did you hear that? Jesus himself claims that he is the truth. You know what? He is. Jesus and whatever he says is true. He doesn't lie. He can't tell a lie. In fact, that's one of the things that people enjoy doing these days, isn't it? People enjoy telling lies. They like telling lies, they like swearing, they like all sorts of greed and all sorts of things. And you know what? When people do that, um, love isn't there. Love does not rejoice in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. Now, another thing which we can think about about the truth is that the truth is also God's word, the Bible, okay? Where we can find out about what God says and everything about God. We can also find out about the truth, which is Jesus and what he's done for us. And you know what? Christians all over the world this Sunday are going to be rejoicing in the truth. And you know what they're going to be doing? In their hearts, they're going to be praising God. They're going to be saying, wow, hallelujah, what has God done for me? I, I'm rejoicing in Jesus. I'm rejoicing in his word. His word gives me hope. It gives me joy. It gives me life. You know, that's why we come to church every Sunday. You know, Christians, we just love to come to church, to be with other Christians, to rejoice in God. And, you know, part of that is singing. Part of that is uh, just thinking and meditating and thinking about what God has done. You know, and that's what happens in the Psalms. You know, there was a fellow called David and, you know, he took great rejoicing in God and in the truth because he saw the truth all around him. Listen to this. This is him rejoicing in her creation. I've just shown you a beautiful plant, haven't I? OK, and you can see its beauty. You know, something inside of me when I see that beauty and I think, you know what? That's not just an accident. That's got a designer. It's God. I, I start to look at that and I go, wow, hallelujah. Isn't that God amazing? Just to make such a little tiny plant like that and it looks so beautiful. You know what? We can take great pleasure in God, children. Children, the best thing is to know God and to rejoice in him. Because Jesus says, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, and again, I say rejoice. You know, the Bible, that's what the Bible says. You know, here was a man in, called David and this was what he was doing. He says, listen to this, children. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Now, there's lots of complicated words there, children. But did you hear? Children are mentioned in here. Listen to this. Through the praise of children and infants. You know, when, when God's children, little children, older children, you know, I'm a child of God as well. You know, when we start to praise God, something starts to happen and something starts to happen uh, spiritually inside of us, you know, and the things which are against God, they melt away and they don't, they, they can't stand it. And listen to this, listen to what else this man says. He says, 
When I consider your heavens, I wonder whether you've ever looked at the sky and you've gone, wow, isn't that amazing, the stars and everything up there. Uh, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and human beings that you care for them? You know, God cares for each one of us and yet God is so big, you know. And sometimes when we listen to this and we hear these truths, something inside of us starts to go, you know, I'm rejoicing in God, my saviour. And, you know, if you're a child of God today, that's you. And, you know, that you've been, you're a very special person. You have received Jesus. And if you haven't received Jesus yet, you can also be a worshipper of God in spirit and in truth. All you have to do is say sorry to the Lord and turn away from your sin and to ask Jesus to forgive you and give you new life and that you might receive him for yourself. And you know, Jesus answers prayer. So God bless you, and I pray that this would be a blessing to you. Love is patient, love is kind, everywhere and every time, it gives its place in line to serve another, but my heart it struggles so, I need your grace to grow, Lord help me give and show this love to others, Jesus set me free to love unselfishly, because you
You just heard that. Romans chapter 3, verse 19 to 26. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be justified and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, shall we pray? Lord God, we just come to you this morning and we want to thank you and praise you that we can come into your house, Lord, we can come with your people and we can come to your word. And we thank you, God, for this privilege. We thank you, God, um, for being able to meet together. We thank you, God, for the love that we have um, for one another, but the love that we have for you and that joins us together, oh Lord. Thank you, God, that you first loved us. Thank you, God, that you have set your love on us and that we are clothed in your righteousness. We, we sang about that this morning, um, how there is nothing in us, oh Lord. It is all of you, your righteousness. And we thank you, God, that we can read about that now in your word. And we pray, Lord God, for those um, who are unable to be with us this morning, um, for those in our fellowship who are sick at the moment, for those who are going through great trials, we do bring them to you. Um, we pray that you would help them, surround them with your love, O oh Lord, and uphold them. And we pray for those in great need at the moment that need um, just a touch from you. And we pray for each one of them. You know them by name. And we pray, Lord God, for our, our nation, we think about um, all the leaders even meeting this week of the different nations. And Lord God, what are they in your sight, O oh Lord? They are just men. And we bring them to you and we ask, Lord God, that you would um, rule over our nation, that you would rule over the, the, the government that is in control of our nation. And we pray that you um, would be at work in our country. We thank you um, for the blessing of even... Um, being able to provide vaccines for our country, but we think of um, those around the world who uh, are still in great suffering, who are still under um, a lot of fear and a lot of sickness, and we do bring them to you. And we know that you are in control of all things. We know that you, um, nothing happens without your say so. And we just thank you, God, that we are trusting in something much greater much greater than anything that can be thrown at us or that can even change our, our normal lives, oh Lord. And we just thank you, God, that you are our rock and our redeemer. And we thank you that um, 
our hope is in you. And um, we just bring, O oh Lord, now our, um, our suffering world, our suffering country, O oh Lord, but uh, not just in their suffering, but in their sin, O oh Lord. We, we ask, Lord God, that you would reveal yourself, that there would be um, a great turning to you, O oh Lord, that people would see that they need God and that um, your grace is, is great enough, your, your love is um, wide enough, O oh Lord, and we just pray, Lord God, that there would be a great realisation. We think even yesterday um, in their football match when somebody dropped to the ground and they, um, the whole load of people watching, O oh Lord, are suddenly are crying out to God and praying. And yet, Lord God, do they really believe in you? Do they really see you? And we just ask, Lord God, that there would be a great fall into the knees of people, that they would be crying out to you, that they would desire, they would, they would see their need, they'd see their need of you. And we just pray, Lord God, that there would be an acknowledgement that God has intervened and has saved. And we do pray, Lord God, now, as we come to your word this morning, we pray for the preaching of the word. We pray that it wouldn't just be our minister, Mr. Tracy, but that you would come into this building and speak to our hearts. We know you can and we know you are here, O oh Lord, and we thank you for that. And we do pray that you would use our minister. And we pray, Lord God, that you would um, use the ministers up and down the land this morning preaching, whether online or in churches. We pray, Lord God, that you would come into our churches and we would see you. And um, we just thank you now that we are coming to a, a living God, not a God of stone, O oh Lord. And we thank you that you are here with us. Amen. Well, let's come to God's word together then. Romans chapter 3 was the text. Romans chapter 3. If you can turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Our text is found in verse 21 and verse 22. Romans 3 verse 21 and 22. It's the letter to the Romans chapter 3 verse 21 to 22. It's probably the most important statement of the gospel in the whole Bible, this text. Here Paul begins to expound the gospel. In Romans there is that great declaration. It's in all, he does it in all his letters, but particularly in Romans. That's why Romans comes first in the order of the New Testament letters. It's the greatest explaining of the gospel. And Paul begins to explain the gospel of salvation by faith or justification by faith. Martin Luther, speaking about this verse, he declared it to be, well, he said, here is the gospel. Here is the righteousness of God revealed. Let me read it to you. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. In the next verse, of course, it says we're all the same. We're all sinners. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, what does it mean? That's what we want to look at. Well... Notice he calls it a righteousness of God. So you begin there. It's a righteousness which is apart from the law. It's God's righteousness and it's nothing from the law. It doesn't come from keeping God's commandments, from good works, from living an obedient life. It's apart from that. Indeed, the Bible is very clear. No one will be made righteous, will be declared righteous by keeping the law. It's apart from the law. It's the righteousness which is from God. It's apart from good works. It's a righteousness specifically, he says, which is received by faith. Very important, by faith, not works, but more importantly, by faith in Jesus Christ. We have to believe 
in Jesus Christ. Justification or salvation by faith is by faith alone, in Christ alone, in Jesus Christ alone. That's why he said, I am the way, because he's the only way, because he's the only one who can give us this righteousness which we need to get to heaven. And that righteousness is his righteousness. He is both God and man, and this one who is Jesus Christ became a man in order to live a righteous life. There's only one that ever lived a perfect life in this world. There's only one that obeyed the law and kept it. We haven't, we can't, he did. And friends, he did it for our salvation, he did it for us. If Jesus hadn't been born a man and come into this world and lived a righteous, obedient life, there would be no hope of heaven. He did it for us. It's a glorious gospel. So the title of my message this morning is this. Trusting in Christ's righteousness. Trusting in Christ's righteousness. So let me ask you a question as we begin to look at this verse. Who or what are you trusting in to get to heaven? Who or what are you trusting in to get to heaven? You're either trusting in yourself in your own efforts, in your own works, you know, well, I'm not a perfect person, but I've tried to do my best. I've tried to live a reasonable, decent life. I've never done anything too terrible. God would understand that. Or you are trusting in Christ and his righteousness. One or the other. It's that simple, one or the other. You're trusting in your own self, your own life, or in someone else, in his life. Well, which is it? Now look at the context here. Listen to what he says. This is a negative part of the message, but it's important to get hold of this. But now. The but is a connecting word. But now the righteousness of God is revealed. What he's saying is God has done something now in time, in history, 2,000 years ago. It's happened. Paul, it was fresh in Paul's day. Jesus had just done it. It has now been revealed. The gospel has now been revealed. The word but is a connecting word. The but really connects the positive with the negative. The gospel, the good news, with the negative about the law of God and about man. It states a negative. It states a terrible position. He says this terrible position and then he says, ah, but, but now, there's hope, you see. This negative has to be understood. God did something to solve the negative problem, the terrible problem of mankind. Now, what's the problem? What's the negative, terrible position? Well, in other words, you've got to know the bad news before you can know the good news. People don't want bad news. We have enough bad news. We want some good news. You can go to a church this morning and they'll tell you, God loves you. God is love. God loves you. And they'll just keep telling you week after week, God is love. And you never hear the bad news. And if you don't hear the bad news, you'll never be able to understand the good news. And it won't make any sense to you just to be told God is love. It's a meaningless message. You have to see it in the context of the gospel. So where do we begin? We begin in Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. How does Paul begin by explaining the gospel? Well, look what he starts. He says in verse 18, in verse 16 and 17, he's just announced the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now let's explain it. Well, this is how he begins. Oh, listen to this statement. It's a very important statement. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. The wrath, the judgment, the anger of God is revealed from heaven against all ungod ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Notice the two words, ungodliness and unrighteousness. What does he mean by that? God's wrath, God's judgment is revealed from heaven just as this gospel is now revealed, so the judgment of God is revealed. It is revealed from heaven against, against, is God against me? 
People don't want to be told that, do they? God wouldn't be against me. God loves me. Listen, you've got to understand this. He is against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The Bible describes men as ungodly. That means without God. It simply means the unbeliever who's living without God in the world. Ungodly. You may go to church and be ungodly. You may be religious and be ungodly. You just... You're in charge, you're not obeying God, you're not following him, you're not trusting and believing in him. Ungodly. By the way, you're ungodly if you don't trust the righteousness of Christ. That's ungodly. It's the most ungodly thing you can do. And then unrighteous means you are in your own righteousness. You, you haven't got any righteousness. Unrighteous means zero righteous, no righteousness at all. You're not righteous. Now that's the worst statement of all. Notice it follows on. You separate yourself from God. You separate, separate yourself from righteousness. There isn't a righteousness apart from God. The gospel is all about God's righteousness. Why? Because man does not have any. That's the bad news. He doesn't have any. In the language now of, of Paul here really. And people have disagreed with this. But it's undoubtedly so. He was trained this way. He was trained with a legal mind. A lot of his illustrations and language are used in the language of, of the law court. Oh, it's all about the law of God, his gospel. It's all about the justice of God. It's all about the righteousness of God. It's a legal term, justification. That's what it is, a declaration, a legal term. So now you're standing, put yourself now, you're standing in a court of law. Put yourself there this morning. You're standing in a court of law, you're standing before a judge, and you have been found guilty. It doesn't matter what you've done, just put yourself there. You've been found guilty. There isn't a court in the land that would say, well, I'm feeling a bit generous today, you can go free. I'm not going to sentence you. It's not going to happen. The law demands that the judge sentence you. And you must be sentenced. However long that sentence is. It's the demands of the law of our country. Now then, put yourself in another court. This is God's court of law. Think of God's law. Not the law of Britain that demands justice. But you're now standing before God, the judge of all men. How crazy it is when people, preachers say, God won't judge you. God doesn't judge. I don't believe in a God who judges. How ridiculous, the insane. We get judged by our known natural law. How can we dare to think God would not do less? In fact, his is a far higher standard. The judge of all men, and that is Jesus Christ. He's the judge of the living and the dead. All must stand before him. We must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ. It's coming. So you're standing there, and what have you done? You've broken God's law. That's the picture. And you have been found guilty. Now God must pass a sentence on you. It's just a fact. What's the sentence the Bible says? Well, the sentence is there in Genesis 3. Death. That's where death came from. One man sin entered the world. He broke God's law. And as a result, death came in and death passed to all of us. But not just physical death, spiritual death as well. And more importantly, eternal death. An eternal punishment after death. It's called hell in the Bible. Now that's the most terrible punishment you can imagine. God is righteous. God is holy. God is pure. God is perfect. God is just. Justification is all about the justice of God. It's not about you and me primarily. Just think about God this morning. We think too much about ourselves anyway. We're in this story, but it's primarily about God's justice. He's just. Now, what has he done? Well, 
He is the God who must punish sin. He's a pure eyes to behold sin. He can't look on sin. And his holiness and his law and his justice demands a penalty for the, for the, for the performance of sin. It must be punished. There's nothing more terrible, let me tell you, in all the universe than to stand before a holy God and be found guilty. That's the worst place to be. To be found guilty before a holy God and then face the terrible punishment of sin that God must give if he is to remain just and righteous. Now that's the negative picture that Paul paints here. The terrible position. Let's just read it to show you. Listen to Romans 3. He says, listen. Listen to what he says in, in, in verse 2. He says, <clears throat> excuse me, Romans chapter 3 and verse 2. What, shall, what advantage has the job? Read it from verse 1. Much profit, much in every way, chiefly, because they were committed to them, the oracles of God. But what if some believe that unbelief makes faithfulness with God without effect? Certainly not. Let, let God be true and every man a liar. What's he saying there? He's saying, is there any advantage being a Jew, a religious person? There is advantages, but there's no difference. See, Paul imagines in Romans chapter 2, if you read 2, the, the religious person saying of the terrible description in chapter 1, what terrible sinners they are. Yes, they deserve to be punished. And then he says, you, who are you to judge them when you were the same? There's, there's no difference. If our, verse 5, if our righteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God just to inflict wrath? Can you see his logic? He's dealing with all the questions. Imagine somebody saying, this isn't fair. Is God just to punish our sin? Oh, listen, verse 9, are we any better? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks, all are under sin. For there is none righteous, no, not one. How about that? There is no one righteous, no, not one. You can't get worse than that. None righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeks after God. Verse 12, he says, they have all turned aside. They've become unprofitable. There is none, how about this? None who does good, no, not one. I mean, that's what the Bible says. There is no one righteous, no one who does good in the sight of God. It's a terrible picture. Then you come to verse 19. Now, we know whatever the law says, because this is God's law that says it. It says it to those who are under the law. Under the law means under the obligation to live right, to keep God's law in his world. This is God's world, not ours. And he set laws and we have to obey them. Now listen to what he says. Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. The word there should be silent. Stop. And all the world become guilty before God. When you're standing in God's court and he condemns you as guilty, you won't be shouting back at the judge and saying, hang on a minute, that's not fair. It'll be guilty. And silent. All the world, notice, all the world is guilty before God. And then the next verse is even more important. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Can you see? By your obedience, by your life, by your good works, nobody will get off in God's court. It will not justify you. Indeed, the Bible says, all our righteousness is filthy right. It will not count. It will not be uh, uh, some positive mitigation to shorten the sentence. It does not justify you. You are found guilty, and not just you, all the world is guilty. Now that is a terrible position. That is the terrible state of our world. That's the way the Bible describes it. A terrible condition before God. None righteous, no, not one. None who obeys God's law. None who is living right, according to God's standard. All the world is guilty. John in his gospel tells you, if you believe in Christ, you have salvation. 
If you don't believe in Christ, the wrath of God abides on you. Still on you. The judgment is on you. Oh, but God loves me. You've been told God loves me. The Bible says God does love, but he's also angry with sinners. Every day, his judgment is against us. We are under the wrath of God if we're not Christian. And that is not just a personal thing. It's a corporate thing. Listen to it. All the world is in that position, guilty before God, apart from Christ. Now, that's a negative picture. I don't think you can paint a more negative. Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 3 is pretty negative. I think that's more negative. You see how terrible it is? It's hopeless. Man is helpless. The, 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 the important thing to see is, is, I said last week, it's a personal salvation. It's important to see, yes, all the world, but me personally. Because not all the world is going to acknowledge their guilt before God. But what about you? Somebody put an advert in the Times years ago. What's wrong with the world? And the man replied, Sirs, I am. It's me that's wrong. You start with yourself. Are you right with God? You see how hopeless it is. You are helpless. You can't live right. You can't produce the righteousness of God. You can't keep God's law. You can't. You live to be 10,000. You'd never reach the standard. The Bible calls you a sinner. All men are sinners. Sinner simply means missing the mark, falling short of the requirements of God's law. And then you are judged and condemned. Now, here's the good news. You're ready for the good news now. The bad news has got to be there. Where's the good news? But now. There it is. Can you see how it comes in so powerfully? Oh, that's the position. That's how terrible it is. Ah, but a minute. But now, the righteousness of God apart from us has been revealed in the gospel. A righteousness, a way for us to be right with God without having to obey God's law, which we can't do anyway. A righteousness which is through faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel of the righteousness of Christ solves man's problem. And he has a big problem. The same God who judges sin, who condemns us as guilty, is now able to take that guilty sinner and pronounce them not guilty and acquit them in that court of law. Not say I'm feeling uh, generous today. I'll let you off. The worst crimes you could ever commit. A sentence that really means you should be locked up for life. And he says you go free. Not because he's feeling generous or he's a loving God. Because he's found a way to do that and still remain righteous and keep the law. And that's the essence of the gospel. God has found a way to pardon you and yet still punish the sin. And still uphold his righteous law. Oh, you are pronounced not guilty. You were acquitted of all charges and you are pardoned for all your sin. Do you know this wonderful gospel, friend? Do you know it? I mean, are you trusting in it for your salvation? For the forgiveness of your sin? Has God pardoned you of all your sin? Do you know that all your sins are forgiven, past, present and future? Has he forgiven you so, as far as you are concerned, they're all gone, they've been forgotten. Never mind forgiven, forgotten. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. Your sins and your iniquities, I will remember them no more. Such is God's forgiveness. There is no more condemnation to those who believe this gospel. Who's going to charge you? Christ has died. God has justified you. God has pardoned you. It's all been satisfied. It's all been done. The question you've got to ask, really, if you want to understand the gospel, is how can God do that? How can he do that? Especially if we're guilty, and we are guilty. How can God pardon and acquit guilty sinners? This is the great problem of the gospel. I said the focus is on God, not us. 
This is God's dilemma. How can he remain just and yet justify the thing that he's doing? How can it be just to pardon those who deserve death and eternal death? Those who deserve to be locked up forever. How can it be just for him to say you're free? You're pardoned. You wouldn't get that in a court of law in our country. And yet in God's court it happens and he remains just. It's a just sentence. Does God just ignore his law for a time? Does he turn a blind eye to it? Oh, you know, do we, do we say, do we preach? Well, you know, God is love after all. And why should we not be surprised if we all end up in heaven because God loves us? And he forgives us anyway. No, no. That is not in this book. He will never do that. If that was the case, everyone would be in heaven. And this book tells us everyone is not going to be in heaven. If that was the case, God wouldn't have needed to even send his son into the world to die on the cross for our sin. The gospel itself would be a contradiction of God. No, God will never do that. Because he's holy and he's righteous. But he has found a way. A way to justify us. A way to declare us righteous and not guilty. To pardon us. To satisfy his own demands of the law. Let's read it again. Just meditate upon it. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. It's being witnessed in the law and the prophets. It was there in the Old Testament. It's now fully revealed in the New it's the righteousness of God, verse 22, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are sinners and nobody has been able to live the perfect life. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption. Redemption simply means he paid the price for our sin that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. And atoning sacrifice, some translations, the word propitiation means removing guilt, removing judgment, removing wrath. God removes his wrath away by death, by a sacrifice. That's what blood means. To demonstrate his righteousness. Now, this is a key statement. He's demonstrating that he's righteous in doing this. Because in the forbearance, of God, he passed over sins that were previously committed. That doesn't mean he just forgave everybody in the Old Testament and then he's changed his mind in the New. It means that he was always going to send Christ into the world to deal with the problem of sin. And those who are believers in the Old Testament look forward to Christ. We look back. God was always dealing with them on the basis of Christ. You can read that in the following chapter, chapter 4, David, Abraham as an example. To demonstrate his righteousness. That's what he's doing. Listen to verse 26. To, to pres at the present time, his righteousness, that he might be just. I love this. And the justifier of the one that believes in Jesus. Can you see that? God's way of salvation enables God to remain just. That's the key to justification. To demonstrate his righteousness. That's what it's all about. That he might be just in pardoning you. It's not about whether he pardons you. It's about whether he can remain just and pardon you. Because if he just pardons you, he isn't just. And no judge is. Now look at what he does to all who have faith in Jesus Christ. Look at this pardon. He gives them the righteousness of Christ. That's what he says. Now this is very, very important. You've got to understand this. You're not made righteous. Martin Luther thought he was the righteousness of God meant that he had to be righteous. So he tried to live a righteous life and he failed miserably as a monk. And the more he tried to be righteous, the worse he felt. He began to hate God because he thought God demanded him to be righteous and he couldn't do it. He thought the righteousness of God was what God required of him. But then he said this, when I saw that the law was one thing and the gospel was another... That the law demanded me to be righteous, but the gospel provided righteousness. 
The righteousness of God was not God requiring me to be righteous. No, no. It was God providing righteousness for me in the person of Jesus Christ. He realized it was mine by faith and faith alone. I was accounted righteous now before God. Luther saw it. It is a righteousness of God. It's a righteousness of Christ. It's not ours. A righteousness God is making available to all, whoever you are, who believe. That's what he says. Oh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul begins, because in that gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. But now the righteousness of God is revealed. Has it been revealed to you? Have you seen it? Paul in Philippians 3 verse 9 says, At the end of time, I want to be found. I want to be found on that day when I stand before God and stand before the judgment, not in my own righteousness. God forbid, but in the righteousness of Christ. The hymn writer says, Bold shall I stand. Will you? Bold shall I stand on that great day. How can he say that? Who ought to my charge shall lay? Fully absolved through the I am. From guilt and sin and shame. What's he saying? I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I can stand before God at the judgment and I will not be condemned. Because I'm not standing before him in my righteousness, but in his righteousness. The word justify has got to be understood. It doesn't make you righteous. It counts you as righteous. You are charged to be righteous. The moment Luther saw it, he said, the gates of paradise flung open to me. The gates of heaven flung open. When Jesus died on that cross, he was fulfilling the righteousness of God. He had lived a righteous life. He'd done that. I mean, that was the easy bit for him. Oh, yeah. Obedient, perfect life. Well, he's God. And he became a man in order to live a perfect life. Why did God become a man? What would he do that? To teach us how to live? We couldn't follow the example of Christ, even though he is an example to believers. He lived a perfect life. Can you live a perfect life? Is there anyone? No one can. Jesus was living that life in obedience to the law. And at the end of his life, he said, Father, I finished that work you gave me to do. But then he had a problem. You remember it? He wrestled in the Garden of Gethsemane with that problem. A hard bit because he had come not just to live and obey the law and live a righteousness that will be given to us but he had to come and die die for what for our sin so that God could pardon us Christ would have to be the substitute and take the punishment for our sin the just for the unjust says Peter and Jesus, in agony, said, Father, is there another way to do this? But there wasn't another way. It was the only way to uphold the righteousness of God. So Christ, when he died on the cross, was bearing the guilt of the world, was taking the punishment of sin. And by the way, he had to be God to bear that load. Who could take that? There's the love. There's the love of God. We saw it. He loved me. And he gave himself for me. He went to the cross. And he was condemned for my sin. So that God would be just. In justifying me. So when I believe in Christ. This is what happens. This is man's only hope. My sins are imputed charged to him. And his righteous life is imputed charged to me. If you want an illustration, the best and simplest one is God the judge who condemned me and said guilty, eternal death. Took down uh, his robes off his robes and humbled himself and came into the place of the sinner and was condemned for me. And took my sentence. Took it all. Oh, what a glorious gospel it is. And now he says... There is no more condemnation if you believe in Christ. There's nothing more. God has justified you. God has pardoned all your sins by faith in Jesus Christ and he's accounted to you the righteousness of Christ. There's nobody good in this world. 
There's a lot of good people, you say, yes. But when we're talking good in the Bible, it means perfection. There's no 100% perfect. And yet we have to be perfect to get to heaven. Christ is perfect. We need his life, his righteousness. So let me ask you in closing. Let me ask you, what are you trusting in to get to heaven? Trusting in yourself or trusting in Christ? One or the other. In his righteousness or yours? Well, we've already established. Surely you don't have any. We don't have any. So why trust that? If you've understood the Bible this morning, you've seen that you don't have any righteous. There's no one righteous, not even one. So don't look there. You've got to come to a place where you acknowledge your need. That's why we need the bad news before the good news. We've got to acknowledge our need. This is the great dilemma of the gospel. Why is the church empty? Why does nobody come today? Why is Christianity so low? Because people don't have any need of it. What do I need that for? I don't need religion. I don't need this religion in my life. I don't need this. Oh, but we do need Christ's righteousness. And when people see the gospel, they'll see their need. You've got to abandon the idea of self-justification before God. You've got to get rid of that. You've got to come to a place where you stop trying to say you're okay, you're a good person, and you'll be all right. You'll not be all right, because there's no one good. And actually, actually, you should be able to say this to anyone who you could meet. You know, I'm not as bad as you think. I'm not as bad as you think. Self-justification, no, you say, I'm much, much worse than that. God knows what I'm like. I wouldn't want anybody to know what I was like. Would you want everybody to see it up on the screen, what you live like? Oh, no. I am a sinner. And the righteousness that will save me is not mine, it's Christ. I dare not trust in mine. I've got to trust in his. His righteousness. You see, the wonder of the gospel is it's nothing to do with me. It's all to do with him. It's all been done for us at the cross. It's all been done by Christ. The only thing you're to do is see that it's apart from you. It's outside of you. It's nothing to do with you. And you're to repent and believe the gospel and trust Christ as your saviour. When you trust in Christ, you're trusting in his righteousness, not your own. You say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't get to heaven by myself, but I need Jesus. I need him, and I trust in him alone. And that's the way we get there. Let me close with the hymn we're going to sing. Listen to this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. That means his death and righteousness, his life. I dare not trust, you trust the death and life and death of Jesus Christ. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Doesn't matter how you are, how you're performing, how you're doing, how you're not doing. I will see that tonight, how good you live, how bad you... It doesn't make any difference here. You wholly lean on Christ. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground. He says, a sinking sound. Listen to this last verse. I'll quote this. When he shall come with trumpet sound, the day of judgment, oh, may I then in him be found. That's all that matters on that day. Clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless. How about that? Faultless to stand before his throne. I'll be standing before the judge who can justly condemn me. And I'll be standing before him as the one I trusted in in this life and his righteousness. And I will be already accounted not guilty even before I come to that judgment. That's why Jesus said in the Gospel of John, he who believes in me has already passed from death to life. He shall not come into judgment but has already passed from death into life. God grant us to trust in his righteousness. You've got a choice this morning. Is it going to be me or Christ? Is it going to be his righteousness or mine? Or may you be found on that day in his righteousness alone. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. And Lord, we've laboured the point because the negative point is as important as the positive. But how wondrous is your love for this world. 
that you should love us so much that you should come even to do this for us. But Lord, we've seen this morning it's all about you, not us. About your righteousness, about you upholding your law so that you could have mercy on us. It's your righteousness and your justice and your love brought together wonderfully in the gospel. Oh Lord, open our eyes to see our need. And may we, as we see that there is no righteousness in us, flee to the Christ who alone is our righteousness. Amen. We're going to sing.